Hello everyone and welcome back. So this class is mostly going to be focused on building some more intuition for what the homology groups of a space mean. So a couple classes ago we learned that the zeroth homology group represents the number of connected components. This class we're going to work on an interpretation of the first homology group. So by now, I think we have a pretty good understanding and intuitive feel for what the fundamental group is. And what we're going to learn is that the first homology is completely determined by the fundamental group of a space. It's going to be something called the abelianization of that space. So uh, before we get into the topology, let me just talk a little bit about the algebra and let's get to it. So the first thing I want to talk about is what it means to abelianize a group. You may have seen this in a previous class. But if uh, G is a group, then its commutator subgroup is denoted bracket G G and is generated by elements of the form uh, what I'll write is the this is called the commutator of two elements xy and it's xy x inverse y inverse and why is it called the commutator well note that if the commutator is equal to 1 then uh, just multiplying by y and then x on this side, you get that xy is equal to yx. And so um, this commutator measures the failure of these two elements to commute. And in particular, if I look at g mod this commutator subgroup, uh, then this is abelian because I've basically killed off all the non-trivial commutators. And it's called the abelianization of G. And we'll denote it. This isn't really a standard notation, but we're going to be writing it a lot here, so I'm going to call it AB of G. Uh, so let's just do a quick example here, which shows you that this could be subtle sometimes. So let's take our favorite non-abelian group, uh, the dihedral group. So this is uh, given by this presentation. Uh, R to the n is s squared is 1 and rs is equal to sr to the n minus 1. So remember, r is like a rotation, and s is a reflection. All right, so let's try to understand what the abelianization is. Now, in abelianization of g, uh, we quotient. Well, first of all, we need the quotient by r, r, and ss, the commutator of R and R and the commutator of S and S, but that's always going to be true. The, the interesting thing we have to quotient by is the commutator of R and S. So let's write this out. This is, uh, oh, let's do this to S and R. It's the same thing. Uh, S, R, S inverse, R inverse. Okay, let's see if we can simplify this. Well, S squared is 1, so S is S inverse. So S, R, S, and R to the N is 1, so that means R to the N minus 1 is R inverse, right? Okay, and now S, R is uh, R to the N minus 1, S. So I get R to the N minus 1, S squared, R to the N minus 1, S squared is 1, so I get r to the 2n minus 2. Uh, but anytime I take n multiples of 
r, then that becomes 1. So I just get uh, r to the minus 2. Great. So we need to quotient out by the normal subgroup generated by r to the negative 2. That's if you're. Uh, this is also going to include r squared, which I'll write it as r squared because it's just a little bit easier to work with. Okay. So it turns out this group is normal. Uh, so if I look at the dihedral group mod r squared, this needs to be the abelianization because it's what I get. It's the smallest normal subgroup containing all those commutators. Uh, I don't think I actually mentioned that before. This should be uh, like normally generated by all of these things. So you need to be normal in order for a quotient to even make sense, right? Okay, so uh, now this is the abelianization. And it is generated by R bar, which I'll use as shorthand for the image of R under the quotient map, and S bar, which is the image of S. And let's see what these elements are. It turns out it breaks it up into two cases. If n is odd, then, okay, this is another relation that needs to hold in that group. Uh, r to the n needs to be 1, right? So r to the n is equal to 1, but n is odd, so this is r to the 2k plus 1 needs to be equal to 1. Uh, so r to the 2k times r is equal to 1. But of course, what I'm modding out by is r squared, aka every even power of r is trivial in this uh, in this group. So uh, when I look at r bar to the 2k times r bar, well, r bar to the 2k is just trivial. And so this means that r bar is equal to 1. And... Uh, so we still have s bar squared is equal to 1. So we, we have two potential generators, one of the most trivial, one of them squares to be 1. So the abelianization of dn here, I'll write d uh, 2 times 2k plus 1, uh, or d 2k plus 1, there we go. Uh, is equal to 1. Oh, z mod 2z, generated by s, and s squares to be 1. OK, now, on the other hand, if n is even, then uh, just run the same computation back. So r to the n equals 1 implies r to the 2k is equal to 1 which implies that r bar to the 2k is equal to 1. But we sort of already knew that, so this doesn't really add any extra information. So this was known since r bar squared was 1. Uh, and again, we have this uh, s bar squared being 1. So, oh, and also, we are in an abelian group here. We just modded out by the commutator of R and S. So RS is equal to SR. And this is enough information to determine the group. It's an abelian group generated by two elements of order two. And those two elements, well, uh, so the abelianization of D2K is Z2 cross Z2. Great. So as you can see, it's 
usually pretty straightforward to figure out the abelianization of a group, and um, that's it's really combinatorial and not much of a burden. Uh, here's a nice fact. If H is abelian and F from G to H is just any homomorphism, then, well, F of the commutator of X and Y is equal to zero for all X and Y in G, right? If, uh, just think about a homomorphism, it's gonna shoot those over into the image of H and everything there is abelian, so you move things around and they all cancel, right? Now, what does this mean? Well, then F factors through the abelianization. Uh, AKA the following diagram commutes. I have uh, my group G and I can uh, do this abelianization quotient to the abelianization of G and I have my map F, here's H and I'll get another map F abelianized. So this is just a sort of general fact. If you have a uh, if you have a map to a space and all of some certain elements are, are identified in the target space, it always factors through the space where you first identify those elements and then shoot over. Great. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. In, in last class, we showed that, at least in the case of free abelian groups, uh, homomorphisms between abelian groups are way, way easier to understand than homomorphisms between general groups. In fact, like it's just the gap between them is is infinitely large. Uh, so if your if your target is an abelian space, you're looking at an abelian map, is the slogan. All right. So all of this is leading up to the relationship between pi one of x and h one of x. And the idea is that pi one of x is this non-abelian theory and h one of x is the abelian theory. So if L from I to my space x is a loop, then, okay, the homotopy class of L, which I'll call L in pi, is in pi one of x. And we can also regard L as a, or let me phrase it this way, we can also regard I as a one simplex, right? A one simplex is an interval. And in this case, uh, L of zero is equal to L of one so um, L here is a cycle. Okay, so remember cycles are the things with no boundary. So if I look at the boundary map here, the two endpoints are the same, but one of them comes with a plus sign and one of them comes with a minus sign, so the boundary map is zero. Uh, and therefore, I get a well-defined element L in homology, each one of X. Right? So now, there's a lot of details to check here, but we will get a map. Gamma from pi one of x to h one of x given by, so I start with a loop L in pi, and the output is a loop L, but in homology. And all this business before, 
it says that since H1 is abelian, this map will factor through this map gamma abelianized from the abelianization of pi 1 of x to h1 of x. And this map, we will see, is an isomorphism. All right, summary of just the last 30 seconds. You take a loop regarded as a one simplex. That's a map from pi one to h one. We need to show that, but it, it will be. And uh, since h one's abelian, this map factors through the abelianization, and that's really all that happens. So if you abelianize pi one, you get h one. All right. So the rest of this class is going to be dedicated to proving this uh, this theorem. And it's, it's going to be pretty cool. There's a lot of nice steps along the way where we construct some very explicit two simplices. So uh, let's strap in. we got a long proof ahead of us. It's going to be broken up into a bunch of lemmas, though. So first of all, we need to show that gamma is well-defined. Right? Uh, the fundamental group is not just loops. It's homotopy classes of loops. So I need to show that the homotopy classes get sent to the same thing. So that is more precisely, uh, I can never spell precisely, more exactly. <laughs> um, if P0 and P1 from I to X are homotopic, paths. So this is going to be more general than just loops, but uh, it's sort of easier to show it for paths anyway. Uh, then I need P0 minus P1 to be a boundary. In C1 of X. Okay, so there's a quotient in the domain, which is quotienting out by homotopy classes. And there's a quotient in the codomain, H1 of X, which is we quotient out by boundaries. And I'm going to show that if you quotient out by a homotopy class here, you get uh, a boundary over there. All right. So let P from I cross I to X be the homotopy between um, P0 and P1. Now, consider the map. I'm going to draw a picture of this in a second. B from I cross I to delta 2 given by B of xy is equal to x minus xy in the first coordinate and xy in the second coordinate. So here's the picture. So I have a, a uh, square here, which is going to map down to my space, x. And what the square does is gives me a homotopy between p0 and p1. And I'm also going to have my two simplex here. So I'm going to uh, regard my two simplex as this is sort of like uh, x is equal to 1 minus y. So uh, x is equal to 0, y is 1. All right, good. This is right. So let's track out exactly what's going on here. Here, if I go this way, I see p0. And if I go this way, I see p1. And on the left-hand side, I have the constant map. Right. So homotopies are base point preserving. So this whole left side of the square is fixed. It's the constant map at P0 of 0 
And this here is the constant map at C P zero of one. So let's see where this sends everything. If X is equal to one, then B of X, Y is equal to one minus Y, Y. And if X is equal to zero, then, oh yeah, okay, so what does this mean? Uh, X being one uh, is exactly all of these points here on the right hand side. And so it's sending that to essentially the right hand side. It's exactly this equation I wrote down here. So this goes to C P zero of one. All right, now if X is equal to zero, then B of X, Y, uh, it sort of collapses everything down here. This might be scary, but remember, everything on the left-hand side of that square is set to the same point. So not too many bad things have happened yet. This is C of P zero of zero. Now if Y is equal to one, uh, so this is like the top part of the square here, then B of X, Y is uh, zero in the first coordinate and x in the second coordinate. So the x coordinate is zero and the y coordinate is the x coordinate. Okay, so this is uh, p1 over here. And if y is equal to zero, that's the bottom of the square, then uh, b of xy is equal to x zero. And so now this runs along the bottom uh, part of the simplex, it's P zero. Okay, and now in all other cases, I mean, in most cases, this map was injective, except for on that left edge. But since B identifies points, so this is the map B, if and only if, uh, they are identified under P, that was this map down here, the homotopy. Uh, B factors to a map through the through this two simplex. And I'll call it uh, P delta from sigma two into X. So I get this map P delta over here. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Well, I, I had these paths P zero and P one, and I wanted to show you that they're a boundary. Okay, so let's look at the boundary of this two simplex. Boundary of P delta is equal to, we could sort of see it up there. Uh, we'll be picking the orientation that sort of runs counterclockwise, that bottom left vertex, then bottom right vertex, and then top vertex. And so the boundary of this is uh, P0, but it's a map of one simplex, so this is considered in homology, uh, plus the constant map at P0 of one, so this is an element of homology, minus P1. So when I run down here like that, I run around P1 backwards, so that's minus P1. Great, um, so this is almost what we want. I just want P0 minus P1 as a boundary. And it turns out that's true. But this constant map is the boundary of um, the constant simplex. Uh, which I'll just call sigma C from delta two to X, 
which just sends any point here to uh, P0 of 1. All right, so uh, I'll just skip a little step here. Boundary of P delta, I'll, I'll move this over to the other side, but I'll also re recognize it as the boundary of sigma C. And now boundary is a linear map. This is one of the properties of boundary. So this is equal to P0 in homology minus P1 in homology, AKA P0 of H minus P1 in H is equal to zero in H1, which of course means that they're equal in homology. So big picture, what we did is we took two homotopic paths and we built a two simplex whose boundary was pretty much those two paths. And therefore, uh, these two paths are equal in homology. They're homologous. Great. So that's, that's step one. This map actually makes sense. Here's step two. Gamma is a homomorphism. So remember, gamma is this map that just takes a path and regards it as a path in homology, a one simplex in homology. So gamma is a homomorphism. Okay, so this is going to start with a little side quest. So we start by showing uh, that F bar in homology. So this is the path that runs backwards is minus F in homology. Come to think of it, we kind of used that last time too, so <laughs> it's good to prove it. So uh, to see this, we define a singular two simplex. This will be very highly singular. Uh, sigma of xy is equal to f of x. So this, again, I'm, I'm taking coordinates on the two simplex. The two simplex I'm imagining as sitting inside of R2, which where x goes from 0 to 1, y goes from 0 to 1, and then I have this line, x is equal to 1 minus y. And under those coordinates, I'm going to look at this map here. So, uh, Let's just draw a picture of what's happening here. Uh, here, I'm going to do F. This is basically uh, when Y is equal to 0, you just run F straight across. Uh, when X is equal to 0, I'm the constant map at F of 0. And here, I'll also run f going going this way. It's, I just do the x coordinate of f and you can see I go x coordinates 0 to 1 here. And this is just going to map in to my space, but it's, it's only going to map onto this line here. Um, now, boundary of sigma, and maybe it's a good time to say, this is how singular a singular two simplex can be. I mean, it could be even more, you could map everything to a point, but the image of a two simplex does not always look like a two simplex. So now the boundary of sigma is, uh, I'll again choose this orientation. So uh, first I do F and then I run backwards on F. So then it's plus F bar. And then I, uh, run down this way, but this is the minus, this is V0, V1, V2. So running down from uh, top to bottom is the thing I get out by cutting out V1, so that needs to come with a minus sign. So minus constant map at F of zero. Uh, it's actually not gonna matter that much because again, the, uh, 
the constant map is the boundary of a two simplex. So the boundary of sigma minus this constant map again, this is the same trick as last time, I'm not gonna spell it out completely, is equal to uh, f bar plus f. So f bar plus f is equal to zero in h1 of x, which of course implies that f is equal to minus f bar in homology. Okay, so that's a, a general good intuitive thing to uh, understand. In h1 of x, the inverse of uh, a one simplex in homology is the one simplex that just runs backwards. Same thing as um, fundamental group pretty much. Okay, now, what are we after? We're after showing that gamma is a homomorphism. And again, we'll do it in this more general setting where f and g are paths. So if f and g are paths with f of one is equal to g of zero, then we will show that gamma of f dot g, so this is the one that first does f twice as fast and then does g twice as fast, is f in homology plus g in homology. Okay, and we're gonna do this by defining a two simplex again. So given such paths, define a two simplex sigma p by sigma of x, y is, okay, f of y minus x plus one, if y is less than or equal to x, uh, and g of y minus x, if y is greater than or equal to x. So uh, here are some things to check. If x is equal to zero, then y is always greater than or equal to x. So we get g of y. So let's just keep track of this on our two simplex that we're drawing. X is zero is at the bottom. And here, uh, oh, sorry, x is equal to zero is the left side. And here I'll get g. Uh, and similarly, if uh, y is equal to zero, I get f of one minus x. And then here's the, uh, the tricky part, but you can just plug it in and see. Uh, I claim that you'll get f dot g running this way. And the easy one to see is, what if I plug this into g, y is equal to one minus x, plug that into g, and I get uh, g of one minus two x, right? That's exactly this uh, double speed uh, path running business that we did before. And you can plug it into f2, f as well, and you get uh, something similar, and, and you could check it if you'd like. Uh, so, this is a two simplex, so check boundary and get that f uh, dot g in h is exactly f in h plus g in h. Uh, and the idea is I'm going to get, if I run around here, 
f dot g and then uh, g bar oops yes of course sorry f should actually run this way because I have f of 1 minus x so I'll get f times g uh, g bar which we've just shown is minus g and then f bar which we've just shown is minus f so that thing needs to be zero, and so f dot g is f plus g. Great. We're getting there. Here's our next lemma. Gamma is surjective. That is, every element of h1 of x is really gotten by considering a loop as an element in h1 of x. Okay, let's prove it. So let's fix a base point q. And for all x in my space x, let alpha of x be a chosen path from q to x. Uh, with, in particular, alpha of q, the constant path. Now, uh, since a point is a zero chain, and a path is a one chain, This assignment extends uniquely to a homomorphism C0 of x to C1 of x. So if you give me a bunch of points, like five points, I'll that's a zero chain, I'll give you back uh, exactly the five one chains, which are the paths from those points to my chosen base point. Yeah. Uh, so for any path, sigma in X, we define a loop, sigma twiddle based at Q, by, okay, uh, so I'll draw the picture before I even write down the definition because it's almost so obvious uh, when you see it in the picture. Here is sigma of zero, and here is sigma of one, sigma's path. And I have my chosen base point Q. What should I do? Well, I should look at the path from Q to, uh, sigma of zero, that's alpha of sigma of zero. And then I should go from sigma one back to Q, that's alpha of sigma of one bar. So this is alpha of sigma of zero uh, dot sigma dot alpha of sigma of one bar, right? Okay, now, Let's look at this gamma map. Gamma of sigma twiddle, this is in the fundamental group. I've made a loop out of this uh, one chain, is, well, all of this stuff in homology. Okay, now let's just break that up. Uh, We've shown that this is a homomorphism under this sort of dot procedure, right? So this is alpha of sigma of zero in homology plus sigma in homology. Uh, and then the bar makes it a minus sign, so minus alpha of sigma of one in homology. Okay, but 
alpha of sigma of zero minus alpha of sigma of one, what is that? Well, sigma of zero minus sigma of one is this, uh, is this path right here, and sigma of zero and sigma of one are the boundaries. So this is sigma in homology minus alpha of boundary of sigma in homology. Okay, so what have we just shown? I took an arbitrary path and I've shown that I can basically hit this path plus alpha of some boundary using my gamma map. All right, we're getting there. Now, suppose C, the summation as I goes from one to M, N I sigma I is an arbitrary one chain. Let F be the loop sigma one twiddle to the N one dot sigma one twiddle to the N two. Raising a loop to the power just means do that loop that many times. And if the number is negative, go around the other way. Okay, all the way up to sigma m twiddle to the nm. Now what is gamma of f considered as uh, an element of the fundamental group? Well, basically what we just showed is how to do this uh, on each sigma. And what we get is the summation as i goes from one to m of n i sigma i homology uh, minus this extra term that we're hoping to get rid of, alpha of boundary of sigma i in homology. Okay, well, uh, what is this? Well, this here is exactly my end chain. So this is C, the homology class I want, minus alpha of the boundary of C. And we've won now because we only care about things in homology. If C is a cycle, the only things that get considered in homology, then uh, gamma, th then its boundary is zero, right? So gamma of F in pi equals C. So gamma is surjective on homology. So at this point, we have a surjective group homomorphism from the fundamental group to the first homology. If we understand the kernel of this map, we'll understand the whole map, essentially. So here is our final lemma. The kernel of gamma is equal to exactly this commutator subgroup of the fundamental group. All right, and to prove this, we're gonna write down another two simplex pretty much. Um, so let A be the abelianization of pi one of X. Now for any loop, F1, oh, F, <laughs> let um, F and A be the image of F under the quotient map. So this uh, abelianization is a quotient and quotients always come with these maps. So this loop lands somewhere, I'm gonna call it FA. Okay, now if 
Sigma is a one simplex. Let beta of sigma be equal to sigma twiddle in A. Okay, so one simplex is uh, you know a bunch of lines in there, and I'll complete those lines to loops at Q, and I'll consider that in the abelianized fundamental group. Now since C1 of X is free abelian, and A is abelian, beta extends uniquely to a map beta from C1 of X to A. Uh, we didn't talk about this too much, but free abelian groups basically behave like free groups, which is if you write down uh, where generators go, you get a unique homomorphism if the, uh, if the domain is free abelian. So we'll show that beta takes boundaries to the identity in uh, this abelianized fundamental group A. All right, so I want to look at something that has a boundary. So let sigma be a two simplex. Uh, in the image, So sigma is a map from delta 2 to x. We have the following picture. Uh, so here's my space x. Make it a little bigger. Uh, I'm going to have a two simplex here. And I'll call this part sigma 1, sigma 0, and uh, sigma 2. And then I'm going to have this base point here, uh, Q. And OK, so this is v0, v1, v2. And I'm going to have uh, paths here, like alpha uh, v2, alpha of v0, and alpha of v1. Now, uh, the boundary of sigma is sigma 0 minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2. And note that sigma 0, sigma 1 bar, uh, and sigma 2 is homotopic to a constant loop. Uh, essentially what I've done is, uh, I mean, what I wrote down here is the boundary of this triangle, and it all shrinks into the triangle, therefore showing that it's trivial. OK. Now, here's a pretty lengthy computation, uh, all in the group A. We have that beta oops, of the boundary of sigma. I'll scroll up a little. Beta uh, essentially takes a uh, one simplex, the completed loop. OK, so beta of that is sigma 0 twiddle uh, dot sigma twiddle 1 bar. Just have to run that backwards dot sigma 2 twiddle. 
All right, now let's write it all out in terms of these twiddle maps. This is, and you could follow along in the picture, which I, I think is helpful. So this is alpha of V1. Let me move this picture down. So this is alpha of V1 times sigma of zero dot alpha of V2 bar. That is exactly sigma twiddle of zero. You could follow it along uh, up on that picture there. And then now let's write out what sigma one twiddle bar is. It's alpha of V2 sigma of one bar times alpha of V zero bar. And now uh, let's write out what sigma two twiddle is. It's alpha of V zero times sigma two times alpha of V one bar. All right, now let's make some simplifications here. I'll just copy this. Uh, alpha of V two bar times alpha of V two. Uh, so these essentially cancel and then alpha v0 bar and alpha v0 uh, cancel. And then what we're left with is sigma 0 dot sigma 1 bar dot sigma 2. But this is the boundary of that triangle, which we claimed was null homotopic. And so all of these are going to cancel since the triangle is null homotopic. And then once all of those cancel, I'll have alpha of V1 times alpha of V1 bar, and those also cancel. Great. So we took a two simplex, mapped it over with beta, and in A, it turned out to be zero. So uh, the image boundary two is in the kernel of this beta map. Now, what does this all have to do with it? Uh, suppose f is a loop based at q with f pi in the kernel of gamma. Then I mean, by definition, f in homology is zero. So that, what does it mean to be zero in homology? It means you're a boundary. Now, since f is a loop at q, beta of f is f twiddle in that abelian, abelianized map, which is F abelianized. But on the other hand, since beta of a boundary is zero, F abelianized is one. What does that mean? Well, F is in the commutator subgroup. So, uh, yeah, we, we took an arbitrary loop in the kernel of this map. That's the start. And we showed that it's in the commutator subgroup. So we've shown that the kernel is a subgroup of the commutator, but also since h1 of x is abelian, the kernel must contain the commutator. And so this is exactly the kernel. Whew, we got there.
So here's the summary theorem. If X is path connected, we sort of, we need this because H sees all of the uh, connected components, but pi one only sees one connected component. Then gamma from pi one of X to H one of X given by F in the fundamental group is sent to F in homology is a surjective group homomorphism with kernel commutator subgroup. And that means that if I mod out by the commutator subgroup, I get the homology. So the abelianization of pi one of X is equal to the first homology. And there you have it, that's an interpretation of the first homology. So let me just give some quick applications. Basically any space whose fundamental group you know, you now know also their uh, first homology. Uh, H1 of Sn is equal to zero for n greater than one. Uh, the abelianization of the trivial group is trivial, and the fundamental group of Sn for higher n we've shown to be zero using Van Kampen's theorem. And so now we know the first homology is also zero. Awesome. Here's the next thing that isn't too much new information. H1 of RP2 is, well, it needs to be the abelianization of Z mod 2Z. And since that group is already abelian, its abelianization is itself. And the last one, the pi one of S1 wedge S1 is equal to, well, the abelianization of this free group. You can write down a presentation for abelianization by just insisting that everything commutes so AB is equal to BA. So I have two generators which commute. That gives me Z cross Z. So there you have it. Uh, the applications are endless. You can, uh, basically anything you can use Van Kampen's theorem for now, you can uh, use on the first homology. So that's gonna do it for today. Uh, I hope you found this class as fun and hands-on as I did, and I'll see you again next time.